Welcome to Ask GC Anything, that time of the week where we tackle all of your questions about all things cycling. So James, what have we got in store today? Well, we've got plenty in store, Emma. We've got how to upgrade your carbon frame. Uh, we've also got how to stay motivated after a, term, a period off the bike. And we've even got shaving your arms. Now I did say that right, not your legs, your arms. So that could be very interesting. Wow, and remember that if you want to get stuck in and get your questions answered, you just have to use the hashtag TalkBack. And if you did want a chance to win a three months free subscription from our mates over at Zwift, then use the hashtag GCN Training. So without further ado, I reckon we should crack on with your questions. So first question we've got is from Paul Cotterill, which is, is it better to do a recovery ride or rest completely on your rest day? Well, Paul, this is a great question. Thanks for sending it, it in. It is. Yeah. But I think first of all, we need to tackle some terminology. So we've got rest and recovery, and they're not quite the same thing. So rest, if there's rest you need, if you are sick or you are hyper overtrained or you've just got too many life commitments to have any time to exercise, then you take a rest day, as in no training at all. So rest generally means either sleeping or a total absence of exercise or any kind of training. But recovery is actually a broader term and it's actually means um, techniques and actions you can take to improve your body's physical state. So that normally means adapting to the training load you've given it. And it involves more than just resting. It involves um, muscular recovery, but also mental recovery, your chemical and hormone balances. Um, there's a whole list of things. Mm. But basically, it's more than just resting. Um, and that's where active recovery comes into it. Yes, so now rest is of course really important um, and is a really important part of recovery and that's why recovery days are often referred to as rest days. But I think usually when people talk about recovery slash rest days, they want to adapt their training load so that they can race and train as hard as they can really. So while rest is very important and recovery, sleeping especially, and the physical and mental repair of resting, there are also other actions and techniques that you can kind of help that recovery process. Yeah, and that's where your question comes in. So the active versus passive idea. So active recovery would be going for a nice gentle spin, or if you're a runner, maybe a gentle run. But passive recovery is doing nothing, so total rest. And mm. a lot of people, I don't know about you, James, but I felt much better on a recovery day if I didn't just totally rest, but I went for a little gentle spin. Yeah, I, I was massively the same. I always had an hour in my training program that I could go out, um, uh, not really worry about what. So basically sitting at you know really easy spin, you know something yeah. like 80 watts or something, yeah. and going to a coffee shop because that's I think that's very important. Yeah, part of a cyclist DNA, isn't it? Yeah. Just to sit in a coffee shop for more than your your yeah. ride time. Certainly part of my coffee addiction. So yeah. we we looked for some scientific evidence to back up our feeling that going for a spin is better than. Uh, sitting around resting. And yeah. it's very hard to find actually. So there's lots and lots of scientific research on what to do in the recovery period between intervals in a training session, passive versus active, but not so much about recovery days. But we did find one paper and here we go. This is called The Effect of Five Different Recovery Methods on Repeated Cycle Performance by Du Paul et al of Roman Missouri's group at the Vrija University of Brussels. And I'm so sorry to people of Belgium for my pronunciation there. But it's in volume 43 of Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise, published in 2011. And this research was quite clever. It compared um, cycling efforts, 30 minute time trials with a two hour recovery. And in that recovery period, they compared passive recovery, doing nothing. They compared that with compression and ice at the same time. So compression and cooling versus compression and cooling a bit less versus compression and cooling and active recovery. And the last thing they tested was um, active recovery. So no compression, no cooling, just spinning at 80 watts on the bike. And the interesting thing is that the best technique for recovery they found for that two hour period was just spinning on the bike. So just active recovery, no compression, no cooling. But they did find that active recovery was better than passive recovery. So there you go. We found some evidence to back up the fact that we feel better yeah. after an easy spin. But I think it is really important to remember that it is your personal. Yeah, yeah definitely. It's, it's how you feel. So if you do wake up and you're not, you're feeling under the weather, and you do mm -hmm. want to take definitely. a whole day yeah. off the bike, then do that. But then, yeah. as Emma said, you yeah. know the science does speak, and it said that you know active yeah. recovery is yeah. better. And, and I think for a lot of people, it's what they believe in. So I know some very good pros who, on their recovery days, will literally not mm. touch the bike, and that's part of their mental recovery. And 
you know, your mind is very strong. And mm. if you believe, it takes a lot of energy. yeah, it does, yeah. And yeah. Um, so, if you if you would rather not ride on your recovery day, then don't ride and don't mm. worry about it. The difference is probably marginal between going for an easy spin or not. And the, and the other techniques like ice, um, so ice bars, massage, um, stretching, Dual yeah, also come into yeah. Play. And and they might. Um, I'm not saying that ice bars and compression don't work. It's just that in a two hour window, they probably don't. So mm. if you've got a whole day to recover. Um, a nice bath might make you feel better. Yeah. And massage, generally, most people feel better after a massage. So there's other things you can do. Yeah. So there you have it. You thought that it was going to be an easy answer. No. But we've really... Made it really complicated. Yeah, we've made it really complicated Sorry. for you. Sorry, but it was a great question. Yeah. Thank you. So our next question comes from Michael Roberts. Hashtag talkback. What would be the best next upgrade on a carbon bike in terms of weight and performance benefits? Wheels, handlebars, cranks, etc., etc. Well, I'm going to go straight in and answer that one. I would personally go for a good set of carbon wheels. I think value for money wise, you're going to get performance gains straight away mm -hmm. on weight, aerodynamics. Yeah. So wheels yep. would be my choice. Definitely. I agree. It's the best place to save weight because it's spinning weight in your wheels yeah. and aerodynamic improvements with a good set of wheels is and really measurable. And it's a big part of the bike. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're also quite expensive and we yeah. would emphasize good carbon wheels because yeah. there are some heavy not very aero carbon wheels out there which you yeah. don't want to ride exactly and i think Cy did actually do a video on exactly that so do go and check that out and you can get a more in-depth look at mm -hmm. how much of a difference it makes really yeah. Now the theory goes that rotating mass of your wheels has an effect three times greater than the equivalent static mass. Meaning that if you save 50 grams from your wheel set, that'd be like saving 150 grams from your frame. Or in this case, 800 grams from your wheels would be like saving 2.4 kilos. So the winner of this week's Swift question, so we've got three months free subscription coming right your way is Malta Bodyguard. So well done to you. And uh, for your question, how to train for mountains when you don't live any above four minutes? Now I'm in that zone. I live in the Cotswolds. I don't have any mountains around me. So uh, so what about you, Emma? Yep, also training around GCN HQ in Bath, not many long climbs and I love riding up mountains. So I don't want to lose that fitness. And it's a, it's a common problem for a lot of people who want to do grand fondos or sportives but they don't live near any mountains. So what do they do? Yeah, there are ha several highly recommended methods to implement to improve your climbing when you only have flat, flat roads available. Yeah, so first of all, you want to think about the duration of the climb you'll be tackling in your event. So if it's gonna be 40 minutes, then you need to be doing 40 minute efforts on the flat. And if it's gonna be two hours, because there are some big climbs out there, then you need to be doing two hour efforts on the flat. Ouch. But yeah. that, that long flat effort will help you to train your pacing, which will help you on the climb as well, because if you can pace on the flat, you can pace on a climb. And that will mean that on the second half of climbs in the mountains, you'll be overtaking lots of riders, which is highly satisfying. Yeah. So now that you've got a better understanding of the length and effort required, we can now look at the replicating the demands climbing does have. So when you're riding, think about your cadence, um, maybe incorporate some big gear efforts um, that will give that same sensation that you have when you're climbing. Um, uh, and then, when you kind of select a bigger gear, your cadence will slow. So I would you know, use around a 70 RPM yeah. cadence. Like you'd have when you're climbing. Yeah, and that would really replicate yeah. the same feel. Yeah. And then you can also use a headwind to replicate the extra resistance of climbing. And you know, if there's a headwind available, and frankly, it always feels like there's a headwind when I'm riding, yeah. so it's very handy. You can um, climb with your hands on the top of the bars like you might do when you're um, climbing. So you can ride like that on the flat. Also, that will increase the headwind. So it's like a double whammy. Mm, like a parachute. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> where, yeah. where you're cape flapping. E extra resistance, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then on some days, you might want to perform some VO2 style intervals. So those are intervals that are generally between three to eight minutes in length, and you should have same recovery as interval time. And in a training session like that, you'd want to do between 12 and 30 minutes of interval work as in, in the session. But on Zwift, there are plenty of climbs out there that you can get stuck into, from the five minute shorter climbs, right up to the 14K Alp de Zwift that I'm yet to yeah. accomplish. I'm too or, scared. I'm gonna have to yeah. use a fake name because I yeah. think I'm gonna be so slow. But we did, there is actually the Innsbruck World Championships course um, uh, that we actually have tackled yeah, together. It's got an so, 8K climb, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's got an 8K climb. That's, we raced up it. That's either. actually pretty tough. That, it was hard. That I was surprised. I wasn't, it? yeah. Yeah. We only did one lap and I was knackered. Yeah, yeah. so but, so do go and check that out because it is actually a super cool yeah. course. And, and it's beautiful, yeah. Yeah, and you will really get some, some yeah. climbing in there. Yeah. So, uh, so, and if you implement these training sessions, 
strategies. Even if you live on the flat, you will definitely see improvements with your performance when yeah. it comes to riding in the mountains. So I hope that answers your question. Um, do let us know in the comments section how you get on and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Enjoy Zwift. Yeah. Got a question from Dan Salties and he asks, how do I avoid sweat dripping on the inside of my sunglasses? Dan, I know exactly where you're coming from because I've had that exact thing when riding in hot weather. Emma, can you answer this one? Yep, this only happens to me when I'm riding uphill pretty slowly in hot weather, humid, and so sweat rather than evaporating just drips down inside my glasses. Oh, and generally, I just take the glasses off and put them on the back of my yeah. helmet. Um, but it was worth considering if it's a real problem for you, um, thinking mm -hmm. about the design of your helmet. So there are helmets that have rubber pads rather than fabric padding, and they don't absorb any sweat. So it'll just trickle around the pads and into your eyes, which is it stings, it's horrible. Mm. So, and you can also get new pads for your helmet to like absorb more sweat if they've got worn down or, or, or sort of squished. Um, also wearing your helmet fairly low so there's not too much gap for sweating so that the, the padding catches the sweat. And then if that doesn't work, I know that some people who suffer from this go for either the bandana or the sweat band, which is what, it's a Mar big step. But, Marco Pantani style. Yeah, Marco Pantani style. Um, yeah, I don't but, think I would do it, but you know, but if it helps. If you do kind of adopt for the um, the, f the thick foam, then make sure you think about your hygiene. So do make sure you get that out of your helmet and yeah, wash yeah. it every so often because yeah. it will start to smell yeah, a lot. Yeah, definitely wash your helmet padding because it starts to stink after a while. Yeah, uh, and you don't want that. No, you don't want that. We do actually have... Also spots. You don't want spots over No, you don't. No. So. <laughs> Hygiene. Important. Yeah. Oh, we do actually have a video. Uh, how On to how, care. Yeah, how to care and keep your sunglasses nice and clean and well looked after. Now, for a fully thorough clean, if you have lenses that can easily be removed or designed to be removed, you're going to want to take those out. Now, it's amazing how much salt from sweat can gather inside of the lens and the frame, as well as also around the nose pad or rubber ear grippers. And also, the oils from your sweat can actually damage these bits, so you are going to want to take particularly good care of them. The next question comes from Garrett Richardson, who says, I've recently been off the bike after a month for a variety of reasons. I tried to stay active during that time, but definitely not at the volume or intensity as usual. What are recommended workouts to prepare for a race in one month's time? Ooh. Well, I'd personally recommend Chris's Get Fit Quick series. Now that will take you from approaching the, the whole series. So the first episode will be about your introduction and it will take you all the way up to preparing for your event or your race. Yeah, so then he's got plenty of different sessions to try, but it also addresses certain ways and tactics that you can really make the most of your time. So definitely check out Chris's videos. There you go. The next session to focus on are your sustainable efforts. You can include these on sessions from 75 minutes right up to four hours. And generally I'd advise intervals of around 12 to 15 minutes, maybe up to 20. You want to include two to three repetitions depending on the intensity you're riding at. Now these are pretty painful. They're kind of the same intensity that you had in your test, maybe a little bit less. For these efforts, you really want to total 30 to 40 minutes of continuous suffering, basically. It'd be quite rare to get to the end of an intensive session like this without some drop off in performance. That's when you know you're doing it right. When you get to the last few minutes and you're really grinding away and it's hurting. Oh, right, now onto the quick fire round. And the first question it comes from Samuel's Psycho Cycling. Why is the hour record always attempted on a track bike and never a road time trial bike? And are road time trial bikes not allowed on the velodrome? I have no idea, James. Well, the answer is that the UCI rules, the UCI track rules, uh, are implied because this is a UCI event. Huh. And so, yes, you're not allowed to kind of do the records on a on, on a, a road, bike. road bike. You have to do it on a track bike, so there you have it. Fixed gear. Yeah. There you go, did not know that. Thank you very much. So we got a question from Apple Bottom Jeans. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna do the song then, but then I thought better of it. Um, hashtag talkback. I'm a tall rider, it's 195 centimeters. Being a taller rider, what discipline should I be focusing on? Many tall pros like Taylor Finney or Marcel Seberg are either TT specialists or lead out men. I've been cycling for two years and have been getting coached for nine months where my training is a all hill effort. It's all right. hill effort. Well, I think the important thing is that you focus on what you're good at if you want to win races. So. It's not really necessarily defined by your height. So I think we like we see tall sprinters, we see short sprinters, we see tall time trialists, we see short time trialists. And the thing is that cycling is actually not a very heightest sport, mostly. Mm. Um, like for example, I have an example that shows off here. When I was on the podium in Beijing, 
The woman who was on the third step, so a step below me, actually looked taller than me in the photo <laughs> because she's Karen Turek. I can she was, imagine, to be fair. She's 25 <laughs> centimetres taller than me. And we both had medals in the same discipline. So I'm fairly midgety mm. and she's really quite tall and we've both got medals in the time trial. So just like, so Have we got a picture of that? Probably someone has a picture. Um, oh. I'm sure there's a picture out there somewhere. But the yeah. funny thing is that, like, basically, your height shouldn't be what you're thinking about. You should be thinking about what you're good at. So go yeah. out there, try a few things, have fun, and race at what you reckon you're going to be good at. Yeah. Next question from Ethan Webb. Hashtag tall bike. Is there any way that we can buy your jerseys? They're really cool, and I like them. Well, well yes. I'm glad you like them yes. as well. It's, I think it's because they're modelled so well by James et al. And uh, here, yeah. yeah. You can buy the cycling kit and the casual kit all in the GCN shop. So check do it out. go check out the shop. There's loads of great offers. Um, uh, so yeah, I said that really fast. But yeah, go check it out. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us for Ask GCN Anything. Remember, if you want to get involved, send your questions with the hashtag TalkBack. And if you want a, to the chance to win three months free subscription from Zwift, then use the hashtag Ask GCN Training. But make sure it's a good question because we don't pick crap questions. No. no. No, uh, you can click down here to subscribe. And you can click here for the GCN shop and yep. you can get some really cool merchandise. And you can click down here to watch this week's GCN show. 